this is the exciting thing to find out the rules, to find out the exceptions of the rules, and to find out when it may be appropriate to break the rules. I mean, if there is a bell, there is a bell, and you expect the bell announcing the beginning of the hour. And then sometimes there is no bell, even if there should be a bell. And sometimes there is a bell, but you break the rule because you say, I don't want to stop in the middle of the sentence. I just want to at least continue the sentence. Or you break it the other way around and say, there's 30 seconds, we just stop here. Rule breaking. Even in a very small way. And there, is, there are different rules and different interests. That's something we have to find out, the, the meaning of difference. Which is sometimes very obvious. I should have one of my favorite slides. You will see it next semester or whenever. The rule is, one rule, climb up the tree. And there are, in front of the teacher for this test, sitting a bird, a giraffe, a monkey, a fish, a dog, and a crocodile. So the rule is the same, climb up the tree. The bird won't be able to climb. The monkey will, up, will be up in two seconds and say, and no. And the others will say, well, to climb up there, I may be able to do it, but most likely I'll break my neck. This is as well about rules. Sometimes we have to respect these differences. We may have different rules for different people. Sometimes the differences are not really relevant. Or they are different in different contexts, in different ways. And many rules, we, we simply know them. We don't think about them. Irvin Goffman, a sociologist, made this with his students. And you can do it now at home or wherever. Next time when you go and see your parents, you ring the door if you don't have a key, but ring the door. And your mother, your father comes to the door and opens. And you say, Madam, would you allow me to enter this splendid home, this castle, which is of a beauty never saw before? And your mother will say, well, you're funny today. Oh, you're humble, and you go on and talk in this way. And then you sit down for dinner and you say, my dear sir, would you have the kindness and pass on the rice to me? And if you don't stop this game early enough, you may be unlucky and there's an ambulance standing in front of the house and they collect you to the psychiatric clinic. Because the rule is, you say, hi, Dad, just give me the what's up. This is something you know, and you won't behave in the same way when you go to an official dinner with the president. Hi, lad, just give it to me. Come on, you won't do it. You know this is not the rule. You know if you go to certain places, 
This is not the dress you wear. You know, if you are of a certain age, in a certain position, you don't do certain things. And sometimes you do these certain things you should not do and you get away with it. And sometimes you have to choose. You do something that is not appropriate for you and people are okay with it but your colleagues are not. The bureaucracy is not. Some other status group is not. It's about age, it's about gender, it's about different things. It's as well about different cultures. I don't know how far I can go, but I can behave in different ways than you can. Even if I would have the same age as you, I could do certain things you could not do. All right, this is this foreign. He doesn't know. Same the other way around. If you go to Europe, some of you will go to Banga, you have to learn certain rules, and in certain cases, all right, this is the Chinese people. They do it this way. Fine. Leave them alone. Sometimes it doesn't matter, sometimes it matters, and this is what you have to find out, learn about how far, to which way, and to which extent are values relevant to include in the questions you have, in the questions you are looking for. Then we have, for instance, in economics, and this is what we will by and large talk about. You have something like employment. I can do that a little bit. We have employment. Employment is one of the central values, features of modern economies. mind of modern economies. I'm not talking about economics, I'm not talking about economies of modern economies, of today's economies. Now there is something else. This is the employment rate. And then there is something else. Let's say it's national income, the income of the nation. And then you have wages and income of, from profits. Employment, employment rate are something very interesting because we know it. We know all. It's so easy to look at employment. You have a figure, you open the statistical yearbook whatsoever and you find employment figure so and so, employment rate you have a figure on it. Then comes something employment rate for women and for men is different. Oops. Why? And then you have something else which is unemployment. We'll come back to the de definitions later, exactly what it means. But unemployment, we know it's not employment, not being employed. And we know unemployment is bad. If somebody, if somebody is unemployed, we know it's bad. And we know roughly what employment, unemployment is, Unemployment is being involuntary, not in employment. You are not in, in employment, but you are not unemployed. 
You are students, working hard, I hope. This doesn't count. You are not unemployed, you are not employed, but you are students. We know unemployment is bad. That's the kind of general agreement. Then we have wages, profits, and national income. And we have a huge difference, inequality, when it comes to the distribution of national income. There's 1% of the population owning 70% of the national income, and there are 99% owning the rest. I don't know exactly the figures, but there are ranges like this. We talk since Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street, there's this kind of global, global slogan of uh, the 99%. There is a huge inequality, but there is another huge inequality. These people, let's assume, work 10 hours per day. These people work zero hours per day. It does not mean that they don't work. They may work hard, they may write poetry, poems, they may do the gardens, they may do voluntary work and do the garden for the neighbors, but this is not work in terms of, of employment. Or they may just want to work, but they don't find something. Not even voluntary. So, zero hours, ten hours. And then you have the inequality in terms of income. The simple answer, get these people into employment, then they will get wages, and they have less problems, meaning they can buy what they need to survive. This is the standard answer of economics, and this is a good answer. I think I mentioned this ceteris paribus, under certain conditions, under given conditions. And these conditions are 10 hours is the normal working day. It's a very simple thing. Let's assume these groups employed and unemployed are the same number of people. Five to five. Everybody works five hours instead of one part working ten hours and the other nothing. Very simple thing of distribution. Of redistribution. Now there's the other thing. If we have a high national income, but we find the inequality here in terms of distribution, we can go here as well and say, why is this so, and why is it that we simply accept it, and this has to be as it is? It's an economic question. I can make Qualitative, uh, quantitative studies with it. I can calculate the employment rates, unemployment rates, and wage income rates, what's it? But the other important economic question is what do I want to achieve? And you can make, or you can give strictly economic answers to this as well. But there you will face difficulties and there you will face differences in terms of economic schools. 
This is the preamble to what we will do in economics. You have different schools, and the ones say equality in terms of income is securing a sustainable development, meaning long-term development. Other schools say and show inequality allowing a small number of people making profits, making huge profits, will foster growth, will foster jobs, will foster employment, and you don't have to distribute here. It's kind of complicated to understand, but at least you will get an idea from what I said, that even if you talk about economics in stricto sensu, in a very narrow understanding, you have to look at this question, at the basic question, for whom do I want to work? What is the purpose? What do I want to achieve with the way of fostering economic growth? There are always different ways. You will learn the basics. Be aware of it that there is not one rule, one answer. There is always a huge fight between different opinions. And sometimes it's not a huge fight, but it's about details. This is something you have to be aware of. This is why it is so important really to say it is not by the letter, but by the spirit. And the spirit which unfolds with the growth of life in history. Economics is excellent in making short-term forecasts and making proposing short-term changes. And they always do it. And five years later, ten years later, they run into trouble. If you look at the IMF, the World Bank, many national governments, this is the pattern how it works. What is it in terms of history, in terms of a long-term development that we can do, that we can achieve? And for whom do we want to achieve it? You will learn about rights, law. Law and rights are two different things. They are closely connected. But this is the question you have to look after. Do they really have to stand this way? Or do they have a right to stand upright? What is about fair wages? What is about fair distribution? What all this means, whatever this means in concrete terms, fairness. But this is something we discuss in economics. Economics is, answer to test question one, a social science. I mentioned this the other day. Many, at least of the original, the old economists, well-known economists, had not been studying economics. They studied philosophy, they studied law, they studied different things, engineering. And they came to economics. They did not think in these small little boxes as we have them today. And you find some economists 
who know how to think in boxes. They have had excellent jobs thinking in these boxes. And after a while, they said, I have to stop it. I can't do it anymore because I know the result is wrong. The result is wrong in terms of a long-term perspective. I have to leave this box. I have to read something else, coming to reading. I have to browse. I have to look what is out there. And then we have always this problem. I mentioned referencing. of trust. I hope you trust me with what I say. I try to be trustworthy, to say this is what I think. There are other people who think something different. I try to say, sorry, I don't know it. I can check it and I will let you know next time because I may know where I find it and find it faster than you. Or I may say, sorry, I, I, I don't find it. Just look it. Look it up. Check yourself. There is one thing we all have to do, and at the same time we should question this to some extent. We have to do it to some extent, and we have to question it to some extent. This is positions. You get a document after finishing here saying, I don't know what it says actually, diploma or BA in finance. You studied finance. And then you may get later um, MA and then you get later a PhD and then you may get, I don't know what. And this is your authority stating, yes, you studied it. If you say it, you know what you are talking about. There's a good reason to trust, of course, me, because I hold all these documents. But at the same time, there's a good reason to question what I say, what people say having this authority, having this education. They may be wrong. They may be correct, but they may answer for something, somebody you don't prefer. You would prefer here, they may do it there, or the other way around. So this is part of question. And then there is, of course, this simple trust of providing simple knowledge which is correct or not correct. And if I tell you 20 times the chalk is falling up, something happens. A tiny thing. It's not trust anymore. It's frustration. It's frost. I don't believe it. He always says the wrong thing. And if he always says the chalk is falling up, why should I trust him that he says the right thing in the other, in the other context? It's about the simple content, the statement. As I said, this is a key. And I even quote the complete sentence. And I can see it, I can check it, and I trust this is true. And as this person always says something, making statements that I can trust, I continue to trust. There's the other thing, content two, of this wider understanding. What is the meaning of it? Can I agree with the meaning? Can I check the meaning? And how can I check it? 
So it's not simply the statement, but it is as well, how does he come to this conclusion that allows him to state ABC? Can he reference this? And this is, of course, relevant, hugely relevant, when it comes, for instance, talking about the same thing, possibly, in different societies. We always go to different contexts with our knowledge. And I always find it's interesting, not to say amazing, if people go for a conference or for one week, two weeks to China, to India, to wherever, and then they write a book about the real life of Chinese people, of Indian people, of Latin American people. After two weeks, they know everything about these people. I think it's amazing. They are genius. You may say as well they are completely stupid and arrogant, and I would not trust them because what they know is not about the real life of what is going on. They know, and if they are good, honest, they reference it, I have this information from there. But they would not say, but I lived in these places for one week. And I know everything, how it really is, after having been there for one week. Content is more than the letter. It is about what do people feel. Economics is not about these formulas and graphs. This is the entire economics. One, two, three, four, five lines. That's all. The rest is a little bit reordering, reshaping. But for the rest, you have to know what real life is about. Is it that people have something to eat, or is it that a minority has too much and the majority doesn't have anything? Is it about equal opportunities for women and men, or is it about inequality? Is it about respect in terms of yes, 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 turning around and say no? Or is it about respect in terms of, yes, but can you explain me more? And engaging together. Questioning. Questioning is a matter of respect. Always ask questions. If they are appropriate, meaning if they are relevant for the content, for, for the context, and this is something of appropriation in terms of making it your own. A friend of mine, or former friend of mine, he studied philosophy. And he was studying philosophy for teaching philosophy at a school for primary, primary level, for young kids. And we met the two fathers, meaning himself and myself, and the two daughters. And then he was asking the kids, what do you think, actually? The sun at night, what does it do? Four-year-old, three-year-old three children. What does the sun do overnight? This was a conversation about 15, 30 minutes. 
I never ever understood so well the entire complex movement in the universe than after this 15, 30 minutes. What they said was not new. I knew this from school, from physics, from whatsoever. But the way of engaging, of making it your own, was simply amazing. Helped me to understand something that I knew. So it's not about the knowledge as such, reading, knowing, putting it, in, putting it into the box. It is about this real understanding. And this is why I said it's difficult in this setting, but try to use any opportunity you have engaging with me, with others, with books. If you read books as well, read one book, read another book, compare the opinions. Is it the same? What is the difference? And if there is no difference, why is there no difference? Maybe plagiarism. Try to question yourself as well. It is the most important thing when it comes to economics. What you usually learn is, we always did it this way, so we will continue doing it this way. There is no reason to change. Learning one. Learning two, much more important, we always did it this way. It was okay, but it was not always okay, and it was not perfect. Can we find a way to change things so that they work in a better way? Ask yourself, ask others, discuss it, and try to find a way as well to change things. In economics there is something we kind of forget frequently. We have all our definitions and the clear concepts and we always did it this way. Was it two weeks ago, three weeks ago? Never trust me when I say anything about time. The meeting we have had in Hangzhou, G20. These meetings today, whatever you think about them and whatever you think about the, the honesty of what is discussed there, of the various parties, today one of the major things on the, on the agenda is their environmental protection. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, we hardly knew how to write environment and we hardly thought about there could be a problem with what you are doing. This is something that is today, in which way ever, considered to be important. So we have to find answers to this. This is for personal life, a question. This is for economics. It may be that it was okay for a long time to get everybody into employment and keep this. It may be that it is not okay anymore because of different reasons. This is what we have to think about and this is something we have to think about in economics. Which means it is about responsiveness. Responsiveness, responding to conditions. One of the reasons that we never thought about environmental issues, we have had so much of environment that we didn't think about any problems arising. I mentioned last time exponential growth.
this little piece of wheat or rice, the chess, it's nothing. One corn of rice, it's nothing. If it would be there on the floor, I wouldn't even see it. It's a little bit more, but it's nothing. Until you reach the stage where you say, oh, I have to do something about it. Now I see it, I mention it, it is a problem. There have been many problems in what, what was considered to be a problem today in economics where we said, no, it's, it's not relevant. We don't have to think about it. But because of the growth, the extent, today we think about it. And we have to think about it. And then, of course, the question is, how do we think about it? The waste we produce, we continue producing the waste and then we export it to some other country. Germany was starving this, or is starving this. They produced waste, 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 and then they exported it to India and got even money for this, that they burn it for them. And we breathe the air. For the Germans, it was fine because they had it, they pushed it out of the world. It's corresponding to the needs. It's responsiveness in terms of look what is, what are the conditions, and how do we con correspond with what we are doing, what we are learning to give appropriate answers. Appropriate in terms of that we can do something with it. As more as we know, in terms of rules, in terms of laws, in terms of, not legal laws, but other laws, in terms of the definitions, as more as we know, as better we are able to do things, but we have to know as well what had been coming up in this one quote. We have to know as well about the spirit, not the letter, but the spirit, the spirit which unfolds itself with the growth of life in history. I don't want to leave a huge bulk of waste to my daughter and I don't want to say, okay, she is fine, but her children, my grandchildren, if I ever will have them, they have the waste. We have to think as well in terms of time. We have to think as well in terms of what is relevant here has some effects to another place. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up in, into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever-widening thought and action, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country wake. I have difficulties with the last sentence of the father and whatsoever, these religious touches, but I think it is important what is said there as look at the context again. Don't Stop putting things into boxes and leaving them there and say, okay, everything is sorted. It's there. It's fine? No? Okay. 
another five minutes so I can talk about one box that I think makes it really clear how these boxes are working in a positive and in a negative way. I'm very bad in classifying and saying this is the most and this is not so much and whatsoever, but there is one profession I have huge respect for them. Commonly, frequently said to be translators, but they are actually interpreters. Or they are simultaneously translating. Meaning I say something, and you have the pleasure to translate what I said immediately while I am speaking. So you have the, don't worry, you, as for, for simultaneous interpretation, uh, interpretation, translation, the job is somebody speaks, you listen to this person, translate it into a different language, simultaneously, while I am speaking, you are translating, and you are listening to me permanently, what I say. It's not consecutive, it's not, I say you should translate. You translate, I say you should translate. Then I continue. It's one flow. I did it once for a student because I was with the group, everybody spoke the language, but this one student didn't. So I said, okay. I never managed to do it, but at least I can try and that she understands a little bit. And then I was kind of pretty good, getting pretty good at this after a while. After I always failed before, trying it before I always failed. After two hours, this was about two hours talk. I was wrecked. I didn't understand a single word. If you would have asked me, what was this presentation about? What was the discussion about? I would have said, I don't know. Engineering, the weather, the economic development in 1700, I don't know. I just translated. I focused the box on translation. Only this. I followed what had been said. I translated while listening to the next things that had been said. And after being there, exhausted, saying, just leave me alone. I don't want to hear anything. I don't want to see anybody. I just want to relax. I thought, what is actually going on? That I managed to do this reasonably well, not in a professional manner, but reasonably well, and I never ever managed this before. Do you have any idea? When I did this before, I was trying to do it for groups. Somebody speaking, beginning to speak, and I thought, actually, that's pretty easy. I just continue while he, she is speaking. I, I, I translate it. After half a sentence, I was stumbling and lost the context. And sorry, just repeat it. I didn't. When I translated for this one person, I was sitting next to her, whispering. There was one huge advantage. I didn't have to listen to myself. I was sitting in a box of language, listening, translating, not thinking, not listening to me, not hearing me even. And this is why you have these booths of translators. They are sitting there behind glass. They are talking. They don't. They have their, their, their earphones or headphones. They are listening. 
they are not linked to the rest of the world, and they are talking, not listening to themselves. This is how it works. This is the only thing how it works. The problem with it, you have it in the box, after a while you don't understand what was this about. What did these people talk about? So, advantage, disadvantage of the box, go into the box, look, look at the rules, follow the rules, but at the same time try to get out of it and try to apply the rules in a flexible way, in an appropriate way, break the borders of your domestic worlds. So we'll continue then after the break.